All right, hey everybody. <laughs> I was gonna try and do this like in uh, <laughs> in landscape, but for some reason it's not letting me do it. So we get to do it in portrait, which I don't like. I really don't. Oh, for, let me turn this down. Oops. Lingers in your mouth for a long time. All right. Hey everybody. Okay, so we're gonna do dye pots today. I'm pretty excited to share this with you. Um, and I've got my notes, so let me check my notes. And I'm doing it on my phone because um, that's the comments. Maybe not. Maybe it's connecting. It looks like it's connecting. Okay. <laughs> oh, technical difficulties. I hate them. So <laughs> today, I'm, and I apologize for doing in portrait. I generally like to do my lives in landscape, but for some reason I can't get it to, to do. So there it is. Anyway, all right, so today I'm sharing with you guys um, some dye pots. And the dye pots that I'm sharing with you is my favorite way to dye, and that's in uh, canning jars. So um, I'm going to show you how I do that. Uh, this method is kind of a from the hip net method. So if you like to have a lot of control over your dyeing, this is not the method for you. This is kind of you're at the mercy of what you get but it's really exciting to me so um so also i'm gonna leave in the comments below i'm turning my phone on there i'm gonna leave in the comments below um two links um to some blog posts that i had put on getting set up for dyeing and why i use chemical dyes as opposed to natural dyes um so if you want go back and read those um, and, and, and that'll kind of get you, get a lot of information about the equipment and, and how I set up in some very, very important, uh, safety precautions. All right. So this kind of dyeing is how I used to dye my roving. You can see here's one of the rovings that I have that was dyed in this method. Uh, here's another one. Here's a, I believe this is an alpaca and silk one. All right, I dyed the roving. I also dyed, I like to dye my farm wools this way. You can see some of these are dyed in that same method. And I don't generally do a lot of yarn. Oh, check this out, y'all. <laughs> yeah, if you see this bruise, I ran into the banister, I swear. But it's really, isn't that pretty? Ooh, yikes, okay. Anyway, I also dye yarn that way sometimes. Now, the kind of yarn that I like to dye that way is just the single ply. Um, I personally am not that crazy about how this method dyes up the double, um, the multiple plies, and I'm not sure why, but for whatever reason, um, single ply yarns, I love the way that it dyes this up. And you might like, you might like the way it dyes up um, plied yarn, so you might check it out. All right. So, um, if you read through the precautions, generally one of the big things that I, I'd say is that you have to have really good ventilation when you're using dyes. Um, and uh, by ventilation, I mean um, just a way to get the chemical-filled steam out of your house and fresh air in. And ideally, um, I would die like outside in the garage or on the patio. So let me show you my outdoor space. And the reason why I'm not dying in my outdoor space is, and I'll show you, is because we have this going on. Since it's summer, the air conditioning's on and it's really loud. Plus my neighbor's air conditioning unit's right there. So you might not be able to hear me right now. So this is my die space. And you can see I've got a table and just a hot plate and pots. And I don't know if you can see over there. That's where I plug in. So this is generally where I die. I'm going back inside because it's really loud out here. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's why I'm not dying out there because it's really loud. Um, and also too, I mean, you might not have a space where you can die outside and it might be cold or it might be raining. So I'm going to show you how you can die in your kitchen. You just have to be really careful. So that being said, um, I'm going to take my stuff 
and we're gonna go upstairs and I'm going to try and figure out how I'm gonna put this on my tripod <laughs> doing the portrait I'm, I might have to do a little bit of adjusting and I'll apologize to you guys for that so anyway so yeah we're going to my kitchen which is actually on the second floor in my house and my dog thinks that somebody is here <laughs> all right so here we are in my kitchen I've got my dye pot here and I've got my space right there and let me see if I can get this adjusted um, right now too I am gonna try and answer your questions and I've got all right let me see I'm gonna have to There we go. All right, dear God, please don't let that fall. Okay. <laughs> Here we are in die space. All right. Okay, now let me see if I can get uh, the pad going so I can check on your questions. All right, I can see the chat. Yay, there it is. Let me turn this down because I don't want. All right, so here we are. So this, oh, my notes, let me get my notes. And I also apologize if the um, light goes in and out a little bit. All right, so like I said, the precautions you're gonna need to have is um, when you're in the kitchen, you're gonna want to have some good ventilation and I've got my stove hood, but if you can open a window, excuse me, and put the fan in the window to, to uh, get some of that air out or bring some of the good air in. You also are gonna wanna protect your surface. And let me show you this. I've got a plastic bag here and I've got some newspaper down. What I'm also gonna do, and I'll do this before we get started, is get a, a water spray bottle because what you're going to want to do is spray not like that it's set on cat mode <laughs> you're going to want to spray spray down your paper so then what you're trying to do is at, if you get powder on your paper it's going to immediately strike it so the powder is not airborne because the powder the chemicals in the powders and if that gets into your lungs that's what's really bad um, also what you're going to want, um, I use this aspirator mask. I'm not going to be using it for this example and, um, but please use your mask. And if you can't do an aspirator mask, just a regular surgical mask will do fine. But the aspirator mask, um, especially if you're doing a lot of dyeing, these are, this is the one you want. Um, you're also going to want clothes that you don't mind getting dye on. Um, if you do an apron, I would even put clothes on that you don't mind getting dye on underneath because if wet dye gets on it and it goes through the apron, it's gonna hit your clothes. I also use gloves. Now you can use kitchen gloves, but I like actually these food service gloves. Um, I know they're pretty thin, um, but they also are super cheap. Um, they work well in keeping the dye off your hands. And then as soon as I'm done with the batch, I just turn it inside out, throw it away. So that's what we use here. If, however, you do get dye on your hands, this stuff is awesome. This is called Reduran. Re Reduran, let me see. Reduran. And it is, uh, you can get it through Dharma Trading, and I'll put a link down below after we finish the video. This stuff will get the dye out of your hands if you get dye on your hands. It's, um, it's kind of like a super exfoliant. So. Anyway, so that's that's what um, that's the safety precautions to kind of keep your kitchen safe and to keep you safe. So, but like I said, if you can do this outside, that would be best. If you can do it in your garage where it's not bad, if you get it messy, just make sure you have really good ventilation. That is super super important. Um, dyes themselves, the chemical dyes themselves are not are non toxic, but that being said, they're also chemicals. So the, the problem is, is with a lot of exposure, you can develop this chemical sensitivity to them. And so um, there's a master dyer and she 
has this chemical sensitivity. Oh, this bruise is so terrible. Sorry, y'all. <laughs> she has this chemical sensitivity now from doing a lot of dyeing to where she can't be around an open container of dye anymore. So just take your precautions and just also space your dye days out. I wouldn't, you know, slam and do full days of dyeing in a row. I would kind of space it out. <clears throat> All right. Also, if you have any questions, go ahead and post them in the live chat. I do have where I can see them, um, it, but when we get started, I might, it might be a little bit before I can see them, um, as because I'm not having my eyes completely on my pad. Uh, anyway, but I'll answer your questions. And if you're watching the replay, put them in the comments below. I get notification when I get comments, and I'll answer your questions there. Okay, so what you need, um, the dyes I use, um, and I'm going to share with you how to do uh, protein fibers and by protein fibers I mean any kind of animal hair wool fur stuff like that so we're talking wool silk silk can be dyed this way alpaca mohair dog hair <clears throat> anything like that protein fibers um, I use two kinds of dye I use I like the Jacquard um, acid dyes as or um, they also can, you can also use uh, the silk dyes. I think it's the same. Silk acid dyes. Anyway. And then the Dharma trading acid dyes. Uh, those are, those are meant for protein fibers. Um, if you're doing anything like cotton or rayon, that's a different kind of chemistry. Um, cause with, with wool, you're, you're going acidic with fiber like rayon or bamboo or cotton anything any kind of plant fibers you're going to go um more alkaline so it's two different kinds of chemistry so today i'm just going to focus on the wool dyes because that's primarily what i do um but i'll put a link down below there's a batik artist and she does a lot of cotton fi fabrics and she has some tutorials on her youtube page on how to do the fiber reactive dyes and now she's doing fabric but it would be the same type of thing for for any of your um, cotton yarns or fibers or anything like that that you're using okay so um, you also will need some kind of acid now I generally use citric acid and I buy it in bulk um, and I'll put a link down below afterwards as well on where you can get the citric acid. Um, but you don't have to have citric acid. Actually, uh, household white vinegar works just fine. Um, the reason why I go with citric acid is if you're doing a lot of dyeing, it ends up being cheaper, but that's it. I mean, if you're just doing a little bit of dyeing for some of your projects, then vinegar is gonna do just fine. All right, so you need to have your surface covered, you need your acid, you need your dyes, I, you need your protection. <laughs> you also need, um, I'm using some plastic spoons for the dyes. I also have a jar of water. So when I'm done with the plastic spoon with the dye, I'm gonna put it right in the water to keep, you want to keep your powder as, um, as uh, less prone to being airborne as possible. All right. You have your fibers you're going to dye. Today I am dyeing just some, some farm wools. And I tell you, this is also really good. I mean, you can see this wool here. I don't know if you can tell. This has, this has some yellowing stains from, uh, from the lanolin. I got this at the uh, Black Mountain Fiber Yard Sale that they have every year. And this stuff was, the tips were staying, but you know, over dyeing is just fine with this. It, it may make the colors a little on the warm side, but it's really just fine. I've got, I don't even know what this wool is. This is also a little, has a little um, lanolin stains. This is a Cormo that I got from a farm in California and a Cordale from a farm in, and this is a gray, um, Cordale that I got from a farm in Virginia that uh, vends at SAF. Anyway, so this is what I'm going to dye. And I'm going to use the jars. So, oh, you also need uh, 
just like a gallon jug, a recycled gallon jug, um, and your jars. Um, so basically, what the canning jars do is it kind of shrinks down your dye pot into a small container. I mean, it's the same method you would use if you were using a pot on the stove. It's the same if you were using a crock pot. You can use um, all kinds of, of the same type of stuff. But the jars, um, I like it because it, I can get a bunch of different colorways into one big pot. And I don't know if you guys can see this. I have my big canning pot right here and it holds seven jars. So that means that I can have seven different kinds of colors in that one pot. All right, so the jar generally fits about four ounces of yarn, which is perfect for the roving. And if I'm doing like a skein of, of regular yarn, because those are usually put up in about uh, four ounce skeins. So, but this time I'm gonna use the, um, this, like I said, this farm wool. So, a lot of times what you see, now there, there are other uh, tutorials about dyeing, uh, dyeing in jars, and usually they do it pretty loose. So what's gonna happen is when you have the fiber in there really loose, um, your dye's gonna be able to hit a lot of the areas of, of the um, fiber and it's gonna make the fiber kind of pretty much all one color. What I like to do, and I didn't bring those things up with me, um, if you noticed um, on the stuff that I showed you that there was a lot of variegation. Now to get that variegation out of the dye pot is I have to, I pack it in pretty tight. So I'm just going to start randomly putting the fiber in here and I'm gonna get it really pretty tight. Just stuff it down in there. See, so what's going to happen is when you stuff it down in there pretty tight, um, it's going to force the dye to kind of seep through um, the fiber uh, in streaks, and that's going to give you the variegation. So, all right, that's pretty tight. You want it to be pretty freaking tight. Um, like I said, if you want to measure it out, usually four ounces will get you in there. So I don't know if you can see, that's in there relatively tight. All right, I'm going to move this out of the way. All right, so, ooh, and this is dirty. Let me, you know what, I'm just going to take up this top layer. All right. Okay, so the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to spray down this paper. And like I said, the reason why I get that top layer of paper pretty wet is because if the powder dye hits this, it's gonna, it's gonna turn into dye liquid and it's not gonna go airborne. Also, um, you wanna be careful. If you're dyeing, if you have Formica, you wanna cover this really, really good. If you've got vinyl floors, you're gonna to want to put some kind of drop cloth down on those as well, because the dye will stain um, vinyl. All right, so that's pretty wet right there. All right, I'm gonna get my gloves on. Again, at this point too, I would put my mask on, but I'm not gonna do that because then you wouldn't be able to hear me. All right, I got my food service gloves. Okay, so one of the first thing I want to do before I even open those jars of dye is get everything ready to go. So I've got my spoons, I've got this. I'm going to go with four dyes for this, this piece right here. So I'm going to use this yellow okra. I'm going to use this turquoise. I've got an avocado and a soft tan. All right, these are the colors I'm going to go with. Um, actually, no, I'm not going to use that salt tan. I'm going to use, I'm going to use this Accru. All right, so these are the dyes I'm going to use. What I do 
is I take my empty jug and I fill it with water. All right, so here's my empty jug filled with water. If you're using citric acid, I would do, I would do like a teaspoon for, of citric acid in the gallon. But with the vinegar, I would do just a healthy glug glug. I know that's real um, <laughs> accurate, I mean real uh, precise. But yeah, I would just pour something that's gonna equal about a quarter cup. Um, so what the citric, uh, so what the vinegar is going to do is it's going to help the dye strike to the fiber. So if you add less vinegar, the dye is not going to strike to the fiber right away. It's going to spread out on the fiber a little bit. So the colors will be a little muted. The more citric acid you add, as soon as that dye hits the fiber with the citric acid, it's going to strike. So the more acid, the faster the dye strikes. You want the dye to strike kind of fast just because that's gonna keep the dyes from getting muddied in the jar. Okay, you're gonna see what I mean. All right, so, so I've got, stir that around a little bit. Okay, so what I like to do is I take my fiber. Again, you would have your face mask on. I'm not doing it so you can hear me. And you're going to go with about, can you see, that much dye. And I'm going to put that in one little corner. I'm going to take my spoon, put it in my jar of water to keep it from that dye from getting all over the place. All right, I'm going to take my second color. And again, I'm only going with about that much. And I'm going to put it in another area, and I'm gonna put this immediately into that jar of water. All right, my next one. Okay, this is uh, turquoise blue. I'm gonna go with a little bit more because I love that color. I'll put it right there. Immediately put that in the water. Final cover color is the Sacru. Put that in there. All right. So let me show you this. I don't know if you guys can see. You see how I have it each one put into into like a pie piece on the top of this. If you want to do five colors, you could put it in there. If you do three, just space them out evenly. But you know, I kind of tend to not do more than five colors because um, otherwise it gets a little busy and that's just a lot of dye in there. Um, I would also, some colors tend to overtake the dye pot. Like I don't use this method with anything that has red in it or a really deep purple. And that's just because those colors tend to really, really overtake the dye pot. So I kind of stay away. I do a different method if I'm gonna dye something that has red or a deep purple in it. Okay, so again, you would have your mask on, and I think I'm gonna put my mask on for this part, and that's only because when I pour the water in, sometimes as the water's going down into the fiber, it will, um, the air will go up through the fiber and, and kind of get this powder airborne, and I really don't wanna bring that in. So, so for this, Mm -hmm. Okay, and just until all those dye particles get wet. So as you can see, do you see how that's kind of just seeping down through there? 
what's happening is that acid is having that dye strike on the fiber as it seeps down through there. Um, once you get all the water in, it's going to look like it's going to be a muddy mess, but I promise you it's not. So I just keep adding water slowly until until the, the, all the dye is seeped down through all that fiber. And, okay, you can see I had it packed pretty tight, so it might take a while. <laughs> you just have to pour a little at a time and just wait until it kind of gets down in there. Now, if it looks like the water's staying on top, then sometimes I'll take one of my spoons and kind of push push the fiber and see if I can get that down in there a little bit more. All right, so you just have to be patient and slowly pour that water down. And just wait for that to absorb in and just, just keep going. So like I said, you can see that it's starting to look like it would all be flowing together. But I promise you, when you pull it out, it, it becomes real variegated. Alright, all right, so you keep pouring. And once you get it to where it's all soaked in, um, and you do your seven jars, then I then what you need to do is you need to to heat it up to keep, help the dye strike all the way. Let me take my gloves off. Now I'm gonna leave my gloves on. Um, now, like I said, I use downstairs. I had a hot plate, you know, that I plugged into the the outdoor plug that I have of, um, um, near my back patio. You could also like. Um, put a lid on this and if it's really hot outside you can set these jars out on in the sun and let let the sun do it all day um you could also i, I when i lived in Asheville, we had a wood stove um and i would put a fan in the window to draw the air out even though that wasn't like the most efficient thing heat wise and i would put the pot dye pots on the wood stove and just let them the, the heat from the wood stove kind of heat it. You don't have to have the heat really high. And as a matter of fact, you don't want it, um, you don't want to put uh, the, the can, uh, so in the canner, um, you fill the water up to about here, uh, right like to the neck. And if it were to bubble over, if it were to be boiling, then what's gonna happen is it's going to, to get you know all of the the top of this this jar disturbed with the dye and it's going to muddy up up your dye so you want to keep it at like not even a simmer i mean just pretty much on very low um just to kind of heat up the jar you want the jar to heat up but you don't want it to be even really simmering if it's simmering just lightly lightly to where it's not going to be bubbling up so you put all your jars in and i'll show you so, so I have, and what I would do is for the first, for the first 20 minutes or so, I would have your, your jug of acidy water next to it because once the jars start to heat up, some of that water is going to settle in and you're going to want to top off those jars just a little bit. All right, so when... I would let it simmer, I don't know, 30 minutes, an hour. It just depends. What you have to kind of do is look and see if the dye is striped. So this is one I did earlier today. And you can see it looks like it's a total muddy mess, but I promise you that when you rinse it out, it's gonna be variegated. But what you want to see, and this one still has a good bit of dye in there, is when the water up top um, is is starting to get clear. Then that means that the dye has absorbed into the fiber and you should be good to go. Some, some of them, if it's been sitting and simmering for you know an hour and a half and the dye's 
not absorbing, then chances are that that dye is not going to absorb. And so I would just go ahead and take it out. And um, it probably just has too much dye in there. So anyway, when you, I would let these cool down to room temperature. And then when you rinse them, uh, rinse it in as, you know, really pretty warm water. If you rinse it in cold water, um, when you're going from, when you're going from uh, hot to cold, that's when things felt. But when you're going to hot, they're not necessarily going to felt. So I would go as warm as you can stand it to rinse it out, and that's going to get um, a lot of the, the dye out of there. Just rinse it until it comes as clear as possible. Um, try not to get the let the water beat on there as much, um, and try not to squeeze it a whole lot. Um, as little agitation as possible. And that's how you do it. Um, like I said, I'll put a PDF um, when I do my blog post with this replay on Wednesday. Um, I'll put uh, a PDF of, uh, or a link to where these instructions are a little more written out because I know it was a lot of information that I threw at you guys. Um, but if um, the post will, as part of my regular blog posts on Wednesday, um, I usually send an announce to my uh, email group. And if you're not on the email list, if you click down in the link below um, to my website, it'll tell you where to get to sign up for the newsletter and you'll get that information. So there you have it. That's my favorite way to die. Again, um, the results are gonna be real it's almost like a surprise but I rarely does it come out that that I'm disappointed in what I got and if you are you can always shove that stuff back in a jar and over dye it with some more colors and that actually turns out really pretty because the more colors you add um, the more interesting it gets but you can't really do as many colors in one pot so you can always do one layer pull it out put it back in do another layer with some different colors and that's how I would get more um, do it if I were trying to get more than four or five colors on my fiber or rubbing. So there you have it. Um, I'm gonna stay on for a few minutes to see if anybody has any questions. Anybody have any questions? I know it was a lot of information. <laughs> um, but really it's it's pretty simple once you you get going. And I'll leave a link to down below where to get the dyes, um, the the uh, well, you know where you get white vinegar. You get that in the grocery store. And the jars, canning jars, they're just regular old mason jars. And the canner, um, it, I use stainless steel or enameled um, just because in case the chemicals or the dyes get in there, it's, it's not as much of a hot mess. So anyway, if anybody has any questions, I'm going to be on for a few more minutes. Otherwise, just leave in the comments below and I'll go back and... Uh, answer whatever questions you might have. <laughs> I hope that helps. I know I've been promising you guys some dye information for a while. So um, anyway, yeah, the biggest problem was uh, I usually dye outside and it's just so loud. Anyway, great information. Thank you. You're quite welcome. I hope that helps. I hope it, um, it's also, you know, it's also a really good way if you have some yarn that you just think is ugly it's a good way to over dye your yarn, you know? Um, anyway, could you please put the link to where you buy your dye. I will definitely do that. Is this really a canner pot or will a big stew pot do? You know, I think a big stew pot would do. Um, when you put the jars in, you just want to make sure the jars are not going to tip over. Um, so, I mean, this, Get this one. I don't know if you guys can see this, but this one is the, the typical canner that has oh, that has like the rack. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, um, and that's always good because the rack holds those those jars into place. But if you have like a big stew pot, you just want to make sure it's tall enough to where you can get the water up to the neck. And in a stew pot, you might be able to get like four, three or four jars in there, which would be fine. Um, 
but you just want to make sure that the jars are not going to, you know, move around. Now, granted, um, they shouldn't move around because, like I said, when you're heating up your your water, you don't even want it to be really even simmering. I mean, it's you want it to be just really hot, and that's about it. I would love to know where you buy both your chemicals and your natural dyes. I do not do natural dyes. So, and I have a link um, in the comments that talks about why I don't do natural dyes. I think natural dyes are really cool, but for me, it just wasn't real practical. Um, do you have a metal rack on the inside, the bottom of the pot? Is that where the jars rest on the rack? Not the bottom of the pot. I think you're answering it. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Um, yeah, it has a rack. Um, anyway, so give it a try. Oh, also, you know, if you don't want to do it in the canning pot, you can also put it in the microwave. Um, I would, if you can get a dedicated microwave, that would be best. Because I don't know that I would necessarily want to put it in the microwave that I like, you know, heat up my leftovers. But um, if you put it in the microwave, and you can get microwaves for pretty cheap. I think I got a decent one brand new for like 30 bucks. I mean, you don't need much of a microwave and heck you can find them at um, Goodwill. But if you put it in the microwave, I would do two minutes and then two minutes to cool and then two minutes and then two minutes to cool. And I would do that for a couple of rounds and then check it. And like I said, check the top to see um, to see if the water is getting any clearer than it was. Um, that would be a great way to do it, is in the microwave. Or you just, like I said, set the jars out. If it's a really hot day out, set the jars out in the sun, put them out there, you know, in the morning or before noon and go get them after six. Um, and But uh, put the lid on it because then that'll contain that heat in the jar. Or you could also, let's see, wood stove microwave. Yeah, on the stove pot. Yeah, stew pot. Like I said, just so long as that you've got enough jars in there to where they're not going to fall over. So, all right. Any other questions? I'm going to sit on for a minute to see. And again, I apologize. I hate, I hate doing portrait. <laughs> I had all this set up and, and it just, and technical difficulties. I blame Mercury retrograde. Stacy, I was born and raised in Cary. Cary was a small town back then. I live down there next to Pinehurst now. So was so far as I said, and lived in Cary. Yeah, we just moved to Cary about two years ago from Asheville. Um, we're in probably what was Cowtown <laughs> when you were here because this uh, every uh, all this around here. I'm in um, Northwest Cary, kind of not far really from Jordan Lake and. Um, the Durham and Chatham County lines were kind of tucked up into that corner um, on the microwave what setting two minutes on the microwave just on high like two minutes high and then let it rest for two minutes two minutes high let it rest for two minutes let it rest in between just so it won't like get that's to kind of give it a rest but keep the the um, to um, but it'll stay hot but just to kind of anyway so yeah, so I live in Northwest Cary, um, but it's all brand new developments. I mean, I hear uh, one of my friends has been here for eight years and she said when they first moved here, it was like farmland. So, but it's definitely not that now. It's growing. Anyway, Cynthia, why don't I, I'm not understanding that question. Why do Don, why Don, why Don what? All right, I'm gonna wait a few more minutes to see if there's any other questions. Mm, 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 mm. Yeah, this is, I like doing, you know, I love doing roving this way. And also when you do roving this way, um, you, when you spin the yarn up, there's less likely, you're less likely to get, to get pooling. And same with um, when you're doing uh, the single ply yarns, there's, it's less likely to get pull, pulling. Why don't you wet the fiber first before you put it into the jar jar, like this video? Um, because if you wet it first, um, what's going to happen is 
is it's going to diffuse the colors. You're not going to get as much separation between the colors. So if you do it dry first, you're going to, when what's happening is the water that's wetting it is actually dye water. So then that way it's going to, you're going to get more of a variegation. If you were going for, um, if you were going for, uh, like a, a solid color, if you weren't going for a bunch of different colors, then yeah, I would do that. Um, but I wouldn't pack the jars as tight. Um, I might wet the fiber first, but I don't even think that's necessary. I mean, um, but yeah, if you're going for a more variegated look, if you don't have, if you start with dry fiber, you're going to get a crisper um, edge uh, between your colors. Mm, I'm going to wait for a couple more minutes. Is there any more questions? Maybe, maybe not. So yeah, all this stuff, um, most of my stuff I get from Dharma Trading. Uh, that they they were like the supplier for the tie dye shirt people in the '60s, and they're out of California. Uh, they've got some great stuff. They even you can even get undyed yarn and fiber from them. Um, and I actually they actually have a pretty good selection. I was kind of surprised, um, but they've been building that selection for a while. So they've got some good selection of that type of stuff. Um, the citric acid though, I found the cheapest place to get the citric acid is um, from a company called Bulk Apothecary. Um, and I'll put the link down below for that. They have, um, they're, they supply, you know, people who make soaps and lotions and stuff like that. I buy, I like to make a lot of my, you know, home scrubs and, and uh, body washes and stuff um, using essential oils and I will buy my supplies from them but I also get the citric acid from them because uh, that's the cheapest I've found so far all right I don't see any more questions um, so I'm gonna sign it off and go give it a try and if you have any questions um, especially after you try this then uh, shoot me an email hit me up in the fiber art collective or comment on this video and I will 